The teachings which we teach are the lost teachings of Jesus Christ. They have been suppressed for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years, a conspiracy of orthodoxy upon earth has denied to those who have ears to hear, who have the flame within, the true mysteries and inner teachings of Jesus Christ. These teachings have come to light only recently in this century, and they portray a path of an inner walk with Christ, each man responsible unto that Christ. We are therefore engaged also in that warfare of Armageddon, whereby it is our mission to restore the lost teachings of Jesus Christ to those for whom they were given in the beginning, that they too might know the Lord and know that Lord, that mighty I am presence, which Jesus unveiled as their own true self. I would like to give to you now an understanding of this tradition of the inner mysteries by contrast to that which is taught in the Christian churches today so that you may understand where the line is drawn and truly accept literally the words of Jesus that to those who have not there is taken away that which they have but unto them who have, there is added more and the abundance. This means that to receive the inner Christ, one must already have that light within. Now, perhaps unbeknownst to you, you and I have been accused of being neo-Gnostics. Wouldn't you like to know what that is all about? <laughs> well, you know, neo means new or kind of uh, latter-day or Johnny-come-lately. Well, the word Gnostic, which is spelled G-N-O-S-T-I-C, this comes from the Greek word meaning gnosis, which literally means knowledge. In the light of Gnostic teachings, gnosis has been described as esoteric knowledge the intuitive apprehension of spiritual truths or the knowledge of the divine mysteries which is reserved for the elect and that reservation is made by our Lord Jesus. Professor Hans Jonas is an authority on Gnosticism and he writes in his book The Gnostic Religion that this knowledge is vastly different from the rational cognition of philosophy on the one hand, it is closely bound up with revelationary experience so that reception of the truth either through sacred and secret lore or through inner illumination replaces rational argument and theory. I think you can all identify this when your heart speaks with such strength that you know that its answer is greater than that of the reasoning mind. Those who have the developed heart chakra and who identify with a living Christ within follow the lead of the heart. But the heart must be purified first in order to be an adequate vessel of that Christ so that what we feel in the heart is truly that Christ. Now the quest for the Holy Grail was a quest that was based on a path of initiation whereby through overcoming, through championing the poor and the oppressed, slaying dragons, outsmarting witches and warlocks and so forth, the knights came to the place where their hearts were purified, strengthened, and one with the sacred heart of Jesus. And therefore, the finding of the grail was the finding of the purified vessel, the chalice that was now ready and fitting to receive him. This is the place where the heart becomes the seat of the mind of God and its intuitions 
and its own reason transcends the reason of the outer intellect or the mental body. Depending on where the individual is on the path of life, how he receives the seed of the sower will precondition how he will receive religion and what faith he will make his own. On the other hand, being concerned with the secrets of salvation, knowledge is not just theoretical information about certain things, but is itself charged with performing a function in the bringing about of salvation. Gnostic knowledge has an eminently practical aspect. The ultimate object of Gnosis is God. Its event in the soul transforms the knower himself by making him a partaker in the divine existence. For centuries, the word Gnosticism was used to describe the various religious sects that were labeled as Christian heretics in the second century AD by early church theologians. They claimed that the Gnostics were contaminating the true Christian faith with Greek philosophy. So therefore, already in the second century, there were a group of followers of Christ who pursued the inner knowledge of Christ by way of union with that Christ. And immediately, the orthodox tradition that had been established moved against them to deny the authenticity of their path. With further research in the field, scholars in the late 19th century began to define the term Gnostic more broadly. They said Gnosticism existed before and was even independent of Christianity. Some believed that it was a resurgence of Oriental religion, a religion in its own right, invading the West as the rival and competitor of the Christian faith. What has puzzled scholars is that unlike other religious movements, no one has been able to identify a single source from which Gnosticism originated. Its ideas can be seen in Egypt, Mesopotamia, Persia, India, early Greece, as well as Jewish apocalyptic thought. Some have even referred to Gnosticism as a kind of international secret religion which was scattered all through the Near East in the years just before the Christian era. We also believe that the Jewish sect, the Essenes, that existed before the time of Jesus, followed a path of Gnosticism, and that indeed the rituals followed by Joseph and Mary and the parents of John the Baptist, Zechariah and Elizabeth, that they also followed the path of the Essenes. An astounding discovery made in the last 40 years has at last shed light on the Gnostics and their teachings. In 1945, an Arab peasant, Muhammad Ali al-Saman, accidentally discovered 13 papyrus books or codices in an earthenware jar near the town of Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt. These leather-bound books were Coptic translations of 52 texts from the early Christian era that were made 1,500 years ago. Some of the texts were completely unknown before their discovery at Nag Hammadi. The original Greek texts from which they were copied are thought to date as far back as 120 to 150 AD, and one possibly to the second half of the first century. According to Irenaeus, 
Jesus Christ himself was still living in 50 AD. Unfortunately, some of the papyruses discovered by Muhammad Ali were thrown away or used by his mother to kindle the fire in the oven. Muhammad Ali, who with his brothers had killed their father's murderer a few weeks after he had discovered the texts, asked a priest to keep the books for him because he was afraid the police investigating the murder would search his house and find them. The texts were eventually sold on the black market in Cairo. Most of them were bought or confiscated by Egyptian officials, and one was smuggled out of Egypt. A series of intrigues and personal rivalries over the acquisition and translation of the manuscripts followed. Not until 1977 was a complete English edition of this Nag Hammadi Library in a Jar published. The texts, which vary widely and represent different Gnostic schools of thought, include secret gospels, such as the Gospel of Thomas, which begins with the claim, these are the secret words which the living Jesus spoke and which the twin Judas Thomas wrote down. Now upon first reading that Thomas claims to be the twin of Jesus, we are dumbfounded because we have never been told that Jesus had a twin. But I believe that the word is used esoterically in the Gnostic tradition to mean that he was also the reflector of the Christ of Jesus, which is consistent with the teachings of Jesus that come from these texts, which I will unfold. Writings attributed to the disciples were among these texts, the Apocalypse of Peter, the secret book of James, and the letter of Peter to Philip. There were hermetic texts based on Egyptian lore, and there were texts with a philosophic and Neoplatonic slant. There were poems, instructions for mystical practice, texts which give a radically different account of the origin of mankind than has come down to us as the traditional interpretation of Genesis. Based on his study of these texts, James Robinson, director of the Coptic Gnostic Library Project, says that the debate over whether Gnosticism was just a Christian movement is coming out in favor of understanding Gnosticism as a much broader phenomenon than early Christian heresy hunters would lead one to think. Now, I am profoundly convinced that the teachings of the Ascended Masters have resurrected the true mysteries that were espoused by these so-called Gnostics. I am not convinced that all of the teachings espoused by the Gnostics, however, are consistent with the purity of Christ's teachings delivered to us today by the Ascended Masters. And so I think we have to use our Christ discrimination when we read these texts and go by the thread of contact and the understanding that we have. I do believe that many of us are reincarnated from this tradition, and there is a long history of persecution these 2,000 years of those who follow an inner path of mysteries to the realization of God. To this day, then, we are accused of being heretics and now neo-Gnostics. I think you will begin to understand why as I unfold. Gnosticism seems not to have been, in its essence, just an alternative form of Christianity, Robinson says. Rather, it was a radical trend of release from the dominion of evil or of inner transcendence that swept through late antiquity and emerged within Christianity, Judaism, Neoplatonism, the mystery religions, and the like. As a new religion, it was syncretistic, 
drawing upon various religious heritages. But it was held together by a very decided stance, which is where the unity amid the wide diversity is to be sought. One reason why the Nag Hammadi discovery is so important is that it has provided us with original documents of the Gnostics themselves, rather than what we hear about them from those who have denounced them. As you can see from today's newspapers, if all that survived of this movement were the newspaper articles, future generations would have little understanding of what we truly believed. It is our own texts as well as our own words which say what we believe, but most of all, it is our example and our life. So Gnosticism has suffered condemnation and a trial without jury and without the presentation of the true facts until today in this decade, in this century. Among the opponents of the Gnostics were Irenaeus, church father and bishop of Lyon, Hippolytus, a teacher who lived around 230 AD and wrote his voluminous refutation of all heresies, quote, to expose and refute the wicked blasphemy of the heretics. And Epiphanes, bishop of Constantia in Cyprus about 375 AD. They labeled the Gnostics of their day as dangerous heretics and tried to present them in the worst possible light, thus paraphrasing, distorting, or quoting their words out of context. Irenaeus, who wrote his diatribe against heresies about 180 AD, accused the Gnostics of fraud. Such texts as those discovered at Nag Hammadi, writes scholar Elaine Pagels, proved according to Irenaeus that the heretics were trying to pass off as apostolic what they themselves had invented. He declares that the followers of the Gnostic teacher, Valentinius, being utterly reckless, put forth their own compositions while boasting that they have more gospels than there really are. They really have no gospel which is not full of blasphemy, for what they have published is totally unlike what has been handed down to us from the apostles. Tertullian, a Roman theologian and apologist who later left the church and founded his own sect, warns that the heretics and the philosophers both ask the same questions and urges believers to dismiss them all. He says, away with all attempts to produce a mixed Christianity of Stoic, Platonic, or dialectic composition. We want no curious disputation after possessing Christ Jesus, no inquiring after enjoying the gospel. With our faith, we desire no further belief. Epiphanius, writing of his encounter with one Gnostic sect in Egypt, says that the merciful God saved him from the depravity of the women believers who not only told him of their customs, but also tried to seduce him. I read their books, he says, understood what they really intended, and was not entrapped as they had been. Their literature left me unmoved, and I promptly reported these people to the local bishops and found which of them were masquerading as members of the church. And so they were driven out of the city, about 80 of them, and it was cleansed of their rank, thorny growth. It is astounding to us that those who have begun to be awakened to the inner Christ for 2,000 years have been persecuted. It is astounding to us that before the publication of these Nag Hammadi texts, the Ascended Masters released through our messengership the real path of the inner walk with God, the real understanding of the I Am Presence and the Holy Christ Self, and how we do achieve a oneness with our Lord. It is an astounding statement, I think, for the power of the Holy Spirit to bring to our remembrance all things which Jesus taught us 
as Jesus promised he would, without even having so much a scrap of information to go by, but only the memory of the heart quickened by the Holy Ghost. You have had that quickening, many of you, without either the Dead Sea Scrolls or these books from the Ascended Master's teachings. And by the inner beacon of the heart, you have arrived at that point of unity with the same movement of that revolution in higher consciousness, begun, yes, 2,000 years ago, but begun in the beginning as the original word of God that accompanied us when we took form. Our forgetfulness of this path has necessitated then our receiving it again, our becoming its fullness, our taking a stand for its message, and the recognition that there are those committed who have raised themselves up in orthodoxy as the standard of Christ's message, who are determined that no one will come to the realization that Christ in him is truly the hope of glory, as Paul the Apostle wrote. This then is a very entrenched battle. We see this at the root of kidnappings, deprogrammings, the anti-cult movement, the newspaper articles. They do not want anyone to know the real living message of Jesus Christ today. This is why we are gathered in a conference, an international conference for spiritual freedom, because first and foremost, we must have the spiritual freedom to worship the God that we know and that we know from within. In her book, The Gnostic Gospels, which I encourage you to read, Elaine Pagels poses some crucial questions about Christianity in the light of the Nag Hammadi texts. She asks, why were these texts buried and why have they remained virtually unknown for nearly 2,000 years? Their suppression as banned documents and their burial on the cliff at Nag Hammadi were both part of a struggle critical for the formation of early Christianity. Contemporary Christianity, diverse and complex as we find it, actually may show more unanimity than the Christian churches of the first and second centuries. For nearly all Christians since that time, Catholics, Protestants, or Orthodox, have shared three basic premises. First, they accept the canon of the New Testament. Second, they confess the apostolic creed and third, they affirm specific forms of church institution. But every one of these, the canon of scripture, the creed, and the institutional structure, emerged in its present form only toward the end of the second century, about 180 AD. Before that time, as Irenaeus and others attest, numerous gospels circulated among various Christian groups ranging from those of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to such writings as the Gospel of Thomas, of Philip, and of Truth, as well as many other secret teachings, myths, and poems attributed to Jesus or his disciples. Some of these were apparently discovered at Nag Hammadi. Many others are lost to us. Pagels continues, those who identified themselves as Christians entertained many and radically differing religious beliefs and practices. And the communities scattered throughout the known world organized themselves in ways that differed widely from one group to another. Yet by AD 200, the situation had changed. Christianity had become an institution headed by a three-rank hierarchy of bishops, priests, and deacons who understood themselves to be the guardians of the only true faith. The majority of churches among which the Church of Rome took a leading role rejected all other viewpoints as heresy. This is the denial of the four sacred freedoms and the fifth, the direct 
master disciple relationship with no intermediary. So you see what our founding fathers fought for under the direction and inspiration of the Holy Spirit was that foundation of our pyramid of life, freedom of religion, of speech, of the press, and of assembly, so that we would be able to defend our right to go directly to God through the living Christ without this supposed hierarchy, this tyranny, this dictatorship in religion. They overthrew the tyranny of England and now we must overthrow the tyranny of orthodoxy. Today we see in America a frenzy and a fear of the loss of this power which is transmitted from the prelates and the hierarchs and the false pastors to the rank and file of the people who themselves have been so brainwashed to believe that there is only one true faith of this outer ritual, that they themselves must be delivered by the true shepherds from this centuries-old indoctrination. It is a vicious indoctrination that convinces generations and generations of people that they need only come to the altar and confess Jesus Christ and they will go to heaven. Yet this is what orthodoxy has done. They have deprived the individual of the inner walk with Jesus. This is the very core and crux of evil that must go down and this is why we live. We have come again to defeat it so that never more there can exist upon this planet a world dictatorship of a world council of churches. and keepers of the flame and revolutionaries of East and West who have come out of these religious forms. I promise you that I am here to arm you with knowledge to win in this revolution. that knowledge is gnosis. Gnosis from the Lord. Pagels continues, deploring the diversity of the earlier movement, Bishop Irenaeus and his followers insisted that there could be only one church, and outside of that church he declared there is no salvation. Members of this church alone are orthodox. Orthodox comes from the root word meaning straight thinking. Straight jacket thinking. <laughs> orthodox Christians. He claimed this church must be Catholic, and you know the word Catholic means universal. In other words, it must be in universal control of the souls of everyone upon earth. And that is what its missionaries have been going out to do for 2,000 years to make sure that the souls of all people were in universal control of the straight jacket letter of the law interpreters of the Holy Spirit mission of Jesus Christ, which is your mission and my mission also. Whoever challenged that consensus, arguing instead for other forms of Christian teachings, was declared to be a heretic and expelled. 
when the Orthodox gained military support sometime after the Emperor Constantine became Christian in the fourth century, the penalty for heresy escalated. Christian bishops previously victimized by the police now commanded them. Possession of books denounced as heretical was made a criminal offense. Copies of such books were burned and destroyed. But in Upper Egypt, someone, possibly a monk from a nearby monastery of St. Pacomius, took the banned books and hid them from their destruction in the jar where they remained buried for almost 1,600 years. But those who wrote and circulated these texts did not regard themselves as heretics. Most of the writings use Christian terminology, unmistakably related to a Jewish heritage. Many claim to offer traditions about Jesus that are secret, hidden from the many who constitute what in the second century came to be called the Catholic Church. Traditionally, historians have told us, says Pagels, that the Orthodox objected to Gnostic views for religious and philosophic reasons. Certainly they did. Yet investigation of the newly discovered Gnostic sources suggests another dimension of the controversy. It suggests that these religious debates, questions on the nature of God or of Christ, simultaneously bear social and political implications that are crucial to the development of Christianity as an institutional religion. In simplest terms, ideas which bear implications contrary to that development come to be labeled as heresy. Ideas which implicitly support it become orthodox. Now, during the second century, a variety of Gnostic sects flourished, ranging, for instance, from those encouraging promiscuity to those espousing a strict asceticism. Although their doctrines differed as well, they did share some basic beliefs. What were these teachings that so enraged the early church theologians? As we have said, the Gnostics emphasized gnosis, esoteric knowledge or knowledge of one's true self, as opposed to the orthodox emphasis on faith. As you know, that emphasis continues. If you ask a priest, a minister, or a rabbi why, he tells you it is a mystery, you must accept it on faith. And the truth is, he does not know the mystery either. I know this because I spent my teenage and college years going to priests, ministers, and rabbis and asking them questions. And I knew that they had no contact with the inner mystery of which they were the self-appointed guardians. This is akin to the ancient Greek proverb, know thyself inscribed on the temple at Delphi. What they did not inscribe on the temple at Delphi, where it was written, man, know thyself, was the completion of the statement by Jesus given in secret to his disciples when he said, man, know thyself as God. Gnostics rejected the need for an ecclesiastical organization with a hierarchical structure to mediate their personal quest for self-knowledge. They dared to challenge the false hierarchy of fallen angels who entered the church to destroy Christ in the sons and daughters of God. They dared to challenge them. Can we do any less? No. In challenging them, you must be armed with knowledge, and that knowledge is the inner knowledge of oneself as the fruition, the fulfillment of the teaching that you hear, and that is transferred to you by the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit dissolves 
the inability to fully absorb the word. What you receive in the dictations of Jesus and the masters is the power of his presence and Holy Spirit that comes for the consuming, the purging, the preparing of the chakras, so that in those chakras, in those seven planes of being, you may experience seven planes of gnosis, self-knowledge in God, self-knowledge on the Christed path of the seven rays. This is why we are not a religion that only recites intellectually even the Gnostic teachings. We are a religion that delivers the word of God directly mouth to mouth and heart to heart. And it is a religion of the ascended masters working directly with their disciples. And you know it. And you know that God works directly with you confirming the word. Even when I am not there or any part of that communication, you have it through your Christ self. This is the path into which you are led. The Gnostics believed there was a tradition of outer teachings for the public and esoteric or inner teachings for the elect. According to the scripture I read you this morning from Matthew, Jesus himself confirmed that. So if you wish to look to the Gospels for confirmation of the path of Gnosticism, it can be found abundantly. Gnostics believed in a divine spark in man. Among the Gnostics, says biblical scholar Robert McLaughlin Wilson, the Stoic doctrine that the soul was a spark of the divine fire enclosed in matter was prevalent. They believed that the soul was essentially a fragment of the divine imprisoned in an alien medium from which it sought to gain release. How many espouse that Gnostic teaching? How many of you espouse it? I do. And I'm not afraid to say so. And if they want to put me in a can and seal me up and put a label on it, neo-Gnostic, let them do it. Wilson continues, return to its true abode in the higher regions was secured either by purification from fleshly lusts, by ascetic practices, by regulation of the whole life in accordance with the dictates of the higher element within, or by a magic knowledge of the names of the ruling powers and of the passwords which were the keys to unlock the gates which barred the way, or by a mystic vision and enlightenment which raised the fortunate recipient above the limits of human nature and made him a god himself. A regulation of the whole life in accordance with the dictates of the higher element within. Long before you ever came to this church, you were regulating or seeking to regulate your life according to the dictates of the higher element within. Is that not universally true of all here today? Yes. Or by a magic knowledge? Have you ever heard of the magic presence? Have you ever heard of eye magic, the seeing of the all-seeing eye of God? Have you ever heard of alchemy as a magic knowledge? a magic knowledge of the names of the ruling powers. It is a magic knowledge because it is, direct, it is given directly by the Holy Spirit, who told us the names of Elohim and archangels and ascended masters and the saints in heaven. They came directly by the Holy Spirit. And who has proved to you that these names are real? You have proved it to yourself when you have called upon the Lord and he has answered you directly in the person of Saint Germain or Mother Mary or Hercules or Archangel Michael. You are proving the law that you are. You are confirming the Gnosis. You are not accepting anything upon blind belief. And if you cannot prove it, you have the good sense to lay it aside until God in his good time should either confirm or deny that which you have heard or seen. The passwords, which were the keys to unlock the gates. Passwords, what are they? 
Bija mantras. Are they not special syllables and words of God that come down from the ancient of days? Do they not unlock the keys of the petals of the chakras to unfold the flame within? And are they not governed by that cosmic Christ, that only begotten Son of God embodied in Christ Jesus? The gates, passwords to unlock the gates. Where are the gates of the temple? The gates are the seven chakras and the five secret rays. This is what we are talking about, sound, the power of the sound of the word, the specific word of God, whereby we do enter in and know this God inside of us as Gnosis. A mystic vision, enlightenment, which raised the fortunate recipient above the limits. So with the raising of the Kundalini, with transmutation by the violet flame, you are raised beyond the limits of mortality. This is the way of Jesus Christ and all saints. Walk ye in it. The Gnostics' view of Jesus ran the gamut from considering him a good and holy man to claiming him very God of very God. Each in its own level may be considered to be correct. G.R.S. Mead explains that a sharp distinction was made between Christ, the divine eon or perfected man, and Jesus, the personality. The God, or rather God in Christ, did not suffer but appeared to suffer. The lower man, Jesus, alone suffered. This is the lost teaching of Jesus, brought to us by Jesus and by the ascended masters. Each and every one of, this, of us knows that the Son of Man, Jesus, was the evolving Son of God as ourselves, and that the Christ of Jesus is the divine being, the only begotten Son of God, who is that universal one that is the Christ of all of us. That Christ does not suffer, but we suffer in the process of putting on that Christ and divesting ourselves of the things of the lesser vibration. Gnostics taught the concept of the feminine aspect of God. We know that there is confirmation of this from Jesus' own lips that he preached in the East and which were recorded in those Buddhist texts that you find in the lost years of Jesus. The feminine aspect of God is curiously removed from the Orthodox Gospels. One Gnostic group who claimed that they had received through James and Mary Magdalene a secret tradition of Jesus prayed to the divine father and mother whom they addressed as parents of the divine being. In the Apocryphon of John, a figure in John's vision tells him that I am the father, I am the mother, I am the son. We are so very familiar with these concepts, not because we have been told from without, but because upon hearing the word, our inner gnosis from previous lives has been quickened. We know from within that when Jesus said to John in the first chapter of Revelation, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, that he spoke of the reality within ourselves of the Father, Mother, God or the divine polarity. So Pagel summarizes these views. Some insisted that the divine is to be considered masculo-feminine, the great male-female power. Others claimed that the terms were meant only as a metaphors, since in reality the divine is neither male nor female. A third group suggested that one can describe the primal source in either masculine or feminine terms, depending on which aspect one intends to stress. Proponents of these diverse views agreed that the divine is to be understood in terms of a harmonious, dynamic relationship of opposites, a concept that may be akin to the Eastern view of yin and yang, but remains alien to orthodox, straight-thinking Judaism and Christianity. Now, Pagels herself does not claim to be a neo-Gnostic, and in this discussion, her referring to these views as diverse, I believe to be incorrect. 
I think every one of these views is true. We are simply talking about different planes of being. In one plane we call Elohim, Alpha and Omega, purity and destreya. In another plane, Elohim have merged as the one God in that fiery spherical ovoid, and there is no distinguishment of masculine or feminine. For the purposes of contacting the masculine portion of Elohim or God on a certain ray, we give a certain name because that is the vibration we desire to embody. So these things must be divided according to the cloven tongues of the Holy Spirit. Pagel's study of the Gnostic Gospels has pointed to several similarities to Eastern teachings. While parallel traditions may emerge in different cultures at different times, she writes, and while such ideas could have been developed in both places independently, she brings up the possibility that in the case of the Gospel of Thomas, the influence could have come from India where tradition says Thomas traveled and preached. Well, she needs to go back a little further to the lost years of Jesus and recognize that Jesus already had brought the Eastern teachings to his disciples and that Thomas had those teachings at the feet of Jesus in Palestine and that he was sent to India by Jesus to continue the bearing of that message of Christ which had begun out of the East and now was returning to the East for the new dispensation to the people. She says what we call Eastern and Western religions and tend to regard as separate streams were not clearly di differentiated 2,000 years ago. Ideas that we associate with Eastern religions emerged in the first century through the Gnostic movement in the West, but they were suppressed and condemned by polemicists like Irenaeus. We also know Jesus himself traveled to the East during the lost years. This we need to understand as a path of discipleship and of putting on this garment of God. Gnosticism is a path of self-realization. Jesus also walked it. That statement is blasphemy to orthodoxy because they want you to believe he was born a flesh and blood God. He was born a flesh and blood God, and since you weren't born a flesh and blood God, you could po not possibly ever equate with the path or the mission or the discipleship of Jesus Christ because he was a different sort of being. He was an exception. He was not like the rest of us, so there is no hope for us sinners except to latch on to his coattails. This affirmation of the born flesh and blood God has denied to every Christian since the role of Christ. And this is why Jesus wept. This is why he wept at the end of his mission. The role of the female aspect of God in the creation is explained in a Gnostic text called the Great Announcement. From the power of silence appeared a great power the mind of the universe which manages all things and is a male. The other, a great intelligence, is a female which produces all things. The Divine Mother is also characterized as wisdom. As such, she brings forth all creatures and enlightens mankind. As you know, this is a parallel to Hinduism, the feminine aspect of God which is seen as the concept of the Shakti. The Shakti is the feminine, generative, reproductive principle without which the world would not function. Shakti incarnates the divine woman and mother, the mystery of creation and of being of everything that is, that incomprehensibly becomes and dies and is reborn. Everything in matter is the release from the masculine of that energy, person, and presence of Shakti. The Buddhist esoteric tradition of Prajna Paramita, the goddess of transcendent wisdom, is looked upon as productive energy. In exoteric doctrine, Prajna Paramita is known as the mother of all the Buddhas. She is said to confer wisdom upon her devotees. 
Many Gnostics, writes Pagels, insisted that ignorance, not sin, is what involves a person in suffering. You are not sinners. You are merely not awake. Who said that one? Mark Prophet said that. <laughs> So stop thinking of yourself as a sinner because while you are beset with that self-condemnation, you are turning aside from the real issue. You are ignorant of the law, therefore you cannot become its advocate for the people. You are ignorant of the law, therefore you have not fulfilled its incarnation in you. You have accepted the lie that you cannot be the incarnation of the word. By those have told you for thousands of years you are sinners, and the only one that has ever told you you are a sinner is a fallen angel or one that has been brainwashed by him. It is a doctrine of Satan that tells you you are sinners. And it's high time that you jump to your feet and shake it off. Just jump up and shake off this condemnation and leap in the air. No sin is here. You know, you've heard me many, many years get after you. Study the pearls, know the teaching, know the word. You don't ever hear me speaking to you, ye sinners. <laughs> but you hear me telling you, you've got to know the teaching because the teaching itself banishes that darkness. That is what is of such concern to me. So let's be seated and hear this. Whoever remains ignorant, a creature of oblivion, cannot experience fulfillment. Remember, we have taught you that ignorance is the ignoring of the law. Even if you have heard and known the law, if you ignore its practice, you are ignorant. You are devoid of its presence here, here in your chakras, here in your temples. Do not mistake your intellectual knowledge of the letter of the Ascended Master's teaching for its full expression in you. Remember, I have told you this, you will become just like the Orthodox Christians. You will say, we know the letter, but you have not the example of the inner fire. And then this religion will die just as Jesus' original mission died effectively in Christianity. It is a tremendous responsibility to carry a living teaching, a living word, a living sacred fire. It is all consuming. We have to desire to be devoured by the fire of the teaching and to devour it. We are being devoured by the fire as we are devouring the fire and we cannot rest in sluggishness and forget that it's the daily reinfusion of the whole planet with what you know that counts and the transfer from your heart to people whom you meet. Be mindful whoever you meet, give them a teaching and don't be concerned if they point to you as a fool for Christ. Be a fool for Christ, but don't withhold the teaching and say, oh, that person cannot accept the teaching. I will be silent. Silence is also ignorance of the law of that Christhood. I found myself sitting in a sauna, in a spa, with one woman who was a Jewish immigrant from Iran. She told me all the woes of her life were, which were based on the sense of loss of her materialistic pleasures and comforts. 
which she had in Iran and does not have in Los Angeles, and of her children's burdens with the things that young people get into in this generation. I gave her the gnosis of the word, of the defense of what is really worth defending, freedom of the spirit. I gave her the teaching on sugar for her children and how to pray to God to be in her perfect place. I gave all this to her within eight minutes. <laughs> and then I left. I had to initiate the conversation. I struck it up. I was friendly and said, where are you from, and so forth. Remember, every moment you are the Christ going after the one lost sheep. Remember this. It is your calling. It is indeed your calling. Do not miss the opportunities. The Gnostic said that he who remains ignorant dwells in deficiency. You know how it is when we know the teachings of good health and what to do with our lives, and we do not apply it. We remain in deficiency. We are worse off than those who know it not because we know it and do not apply it, and we cut off our path of initiation at that moment. We can't go forward. It's like we're overloaded. We're sending a message to the universe. I know too much truth. How can I bring it all together in my life? I can't do it. So truth gets backed up, just like on the freeway. It's backed up. It can't get inside of you. And pretty soon the angels will go to another. The Gnostic gospel of truth says, as with someone's ignorance, when he comes to have knowledge, his ignorance vanishes by itself. That is the power of knowledge. It is a candle and it is a sacred fire that consumes. So we don't really have to get rid of ignorance. And if we don't have to get rid of it, we realize that it was never really real. We just allowed it to occupy the space of our minds like a vacancy, like a void. And as soon as we put knowledge there, we knew. And because we knew, we could say, therefore I am. And then we take it from there. As the darkness vanishes when light appears, so also the deficiency vanishes in the fulfillment. For the Gnostic gnosis as self-knowledge and knowledge of God brings redemption, not from sin, from ignorance. We could say igno ignorance is the only sin. Ignorance is the only sin and the only cause of suffering coupled with the failure to undo that ignorance. The book of Thomas the Contender quotes Jesus as saying, whoever has not known himself has known nothing, but he who has known himself has at the same time already achieved knowledge about the depths of all things. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. He is speaking of the causal body and the great light of Christ. He is speaking of the electronic belt and the subconscious. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. If you do not know that you have a demon of anger that periodically erupts to destroy your loved ones and yourself, if you will not face that the cause is within you, if you will not stop blaming others for your getting out of hand and being obnoxious, that thing will destroy you, and no one can deliver you from it but yourself. You must bring out of the subconscious what lurks there. It trips you in moments of unawareness. You stumble over it, and it is always involved in some circumstance, some outer happening, some relationship and you point the finger and you blame it on someone else. What you do not bring forth in self-knowledge of the lower nature inside of you, hereditary problems, problems of psychology with your parents, if you do not look at these things, they can destroy your soul on the path. Believe me, I have seen it. 
And if you do not bring forth the power of your I am presence, in the absence of that power, you will be destroyed because you will not have the power to overcome what is coming out of the lower nature. Like it or not, karma is descending upon you every day. Like it or not, the dweller on the threshold of your carnal mind will appear to challenge your Christhood. Now, if you know who he is and what he is ahead of time, you will not fail your tests. That's why we give you the album, the ABCs of your psychology on the cosmic clock, so you can begin to observe without self-condemnation or the sense of being a sinner. What are the lesser untransmuted things that are there to get in your way? And what is the real virtue and power of God that you have already externalized in previous lives that you must now bring forth? Because these are your armor, your weapons, your defense. It's the virtues and good deeds stored in your causal body. If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. This needs to become the motto of the working, striving disciple, the Chila, who is not satisfied with who he was yesterday. Today is a new day of being not only God, but more of God, expanding, multiplying, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Each one of us decides our capacity to multiply God where we are. The universe demands an increase. The gifts of God given to you must be returned with interest. That is the law. He who ceases to progress ceases to be. The Gnostic term gnosis is parallel to the Buddhist concept of bodhi, which is enlightenment or supreme knowledge. This state, explains Peter Slatter, is the condition of our release from a seemingly endless spiral of fears, cravings, immature attachments, and distorted perceptions of who we really are and where our true happiness lies. Thus, enlightenment is freedom from what Gautama preached were the causes of suffering, desire or attachment to the world, to the self, the lower self, so as to make oneself liable to suffering. We have become attached to our lesser desires because we have thought them to be our self, and we have not come to realize they are not the real self. And you cannot avoid that issue in your life if you are to move forward. Helena Rorick explains in her book, Foundations of Buddhism, that the source and the primary cause of all human sufferings lie in obscurity, obscurity and ignorance, that somehow unknowing area that we do not probe or penetrate. From this issue go Tama's definitions and condemnations precisely of ignorance. He affirmed that ignorance is the greatest crime because it is the cause of all human sufferings, compelling us to value that which is unworthy of being valued, to suffer where there should be no suffering, to take the illusion for the reality. When you know a portion of reality and you see a friend who is accepting illusion as reality, it burdens your heart. You try to help that one, and when they cannot be helped because they cannot perceive beyond the illusion, you pity their plight and you think that such individuals are above all people most miserable. And therefore you come to the place of Buddha and Christ to solve the problem of how, how to deliver people from their illusions when they do not even desire to be delivered from those illusions. I'll leave that to the master who will speak today to tell you the answer. Thus, these spend their lives pursuing the insignificant, neglecting what in reality is the most precious, knowledge of the mystery of human existence and destiny. For the Gnostic, writes Pagels, self-ignorance is also a form of self-destruction. This is absolute truth. Our identity is the law. If we ignore it, 
It is tantamount to denying it. We destroy ourselves with our preference for ignorance because we are not growing in the multiplication of God by knowledge. According to the Gnostic text, Dialogue of the Savior, whoever does not understand the elements of the universe and of himself is bound for annihilation. That's pretty tough talk, isn't it? The characterization of Jesus by the Gnostics is, in many respects, closer to Eastern concepts than it is to the picture we receive of Jesus in the New Testament. Orthodox Jews and Christians insist that a chasm separates humanity from its creator. God is wholly other. But some of the Gnostics who wrote these Gospels contradict this. Self-knowledge is knowledge of God. The self and the divine are identical. When you know this, you are said to have Gnosis. You don't know Gnosis, you have Gnosis. When you know that the self and the divine are identical, you have Gnosis. This means you have become it. So be careful with your use of the word Gnosis and claiming it. He who claims to have it must be it. We have always told you that what you have not become, you do not in truth know. And you will not take it with you in the hour of transition. The living Jesus of these texts speaks of illusion and enlightenment, not of sin and repentance, like the Jesus of the New Testament. Instead, in, instead of coming to save us from sin, he comes as a guide who opens access to spiritual understanding. But when the disciple attains enlightenment, Jesus no longer serves as his spiritual master. The two have become equal, even identical. According to the Gnostic texts, Jesus told his disciples, when you see as I see and you know as I know, you have become as I am. Equal, twin. Thomas had it. Orthodox Christians believe that Jesus is Lord and Son of God in a unique way. He remains forever distinct from the rest of humanity whom he came to save. Yet the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas relates that as soon as Thomas recognizes him, Jesus says to Thomas that they have both received their being from the same source, the mighty I am presence. That's my interjection there. Jesus said, I am not your master because you have drunk you have become drunk from the bubbling stream which I have measured out. He who will drink from my mouth, the power of my throat chakra, which is the living word, he who will drink from my mouth will become as I am. I myself shall become he, and the things that are hidden will be revealed to him. Quote, from the Gospel of Thomas, not included in the Bible of today because it was considered heretical. This is the lost teaching of Jesus that you can go to all the world and proclaim because you are realizing it. Gautama Buddha has been described in much the same way. In his book, The Three Jewels, Sangharakshita says, though he is not regarded by his followers either as prophet or incarnation of God, from him as the perfectly enlightened and boundlessly compassionate teacher of all sentient beings proceeds the unique message of the path of enlightenment. Both Gnostic religions and Buddhism share the common theme of the attainment of Christhood or Buddhahood by the disciple. Mahayana Buddhism teaches that all sentient beings have the Buddha nature or the potential to become a Buddha. 
One Buddhist Shastra, which is a discourse on the Sutra, says, because the Buddha cognition is contained in the mass of beings, because it is immaculate and non-dual by nature, because those who belong to the Buddha's lineage go towards it as their reward, therefore all animate beings have the germ of Buddhahood in them. The body of the perfect Buddha irradiates everything. Its suchness is undifferentiated and the road to Buddhahood is open to all. At all times have all living beings the germ of Buddhahood in them. Buddha and Buddhahood should be seen by you as your mighty I am presence with concentric rings of light. This germ is indeed a germ and more. It is the great causal body above you. At all times you have the potential for Buddhahood. Enlightenment Gnosis. In the Gospel of Philip, one of the Nag Hammadi texts, we read, you saw the spirit, you became spirit. You saw Christ, you became Christ. You saw the Father, you shall become Father. You see yourself, and what you see, you shall become. Whoever achieves Gnosis is no longer a Christian, but a Christ. One Gnostic teacher by the name of Monoimus said, look for God by taking yourself as the starting point. Learn who it is within you who makes everything his own and says, my God, my mind, my thought, my soul, my body. Learn the sources of sorrow, joy, love, hate. If you carefully investigate these matters, you will find him in yourself. I would explain to you that you also find God in your hatred because you discover that hatred is the misqualification of God as love. You move from the antithesis back to the thesis. When you examine your karma and you experience the suffering of it, you discover God in the right way you should have done things in the beginning. So by the positive and the negatives, all roads lead back to God as long as you observe without the sense of anger against God for making you or your life in the circumstance in which you are. If you are to look to God within, you must look to that God within as the co-creator, the manifestation of him as co-creator, and that you, in a lesser God awareness, created all those things that now bind you and surround you. So you observe God as the law of karma, as the law in your being, which when you work with it, you can conquer the lesser self and see the fullness of God as he really is. Gautama, like some of the Gnostics, chose to remain outside existing orthodox structures and authority. As Gautama rejected the Brahmins, the Gnostics rejected the bishops and deacons. In the apocalypse of Peter, Jesus prophesies to his disciple, and there shall be others of those who are outside our number who name themselves bishop and also deacons as if they have received their authority from God. They bend themselves under the judgment of the leaders. These people are dry canals. They compromise themselves for fear of the powers that be. They preach a religion that satisfy the fallen angels, the power elite and the super rich. That is what Christianity today boils down to, the compromise of the false pastors. <laughs> Gautama advocated reliance on the self. 
Do not accept what you hear by report. Do not accept tradition. Do not accept a statement because it is found in our books, nor because it is in accord with your belief, nor because it is the saying of your teacher. Be ye lamps unto yourselves, those who either now or after I am dead shall rely upon themselves only and not look for assistance to anyone beside themselves. It is they who shall reach the very topmost height. Now, when speaking of the self here, that reliance is upon the real self and the I am presence. And this teaching of Gautama has been confused and therefore people have thought the self was the intellect or the mind that did not have true gnosis. And they have gone out of the way and utterly confused the teachings of Gautama even as they confuse the teachings of Jesus. Throughout the Gnostic Gospels, there runs the same theme of the Master urging his disciples on to self-discovery. The Gospel of Thomas records that Jesus' disciples said to him, show us the place where you are, since it is necessary for us to seek it. Instead of directing them to a place, Jesus answers, Whoever has ears, let him hear. There is light within a man of light, and it lights up the whole world. If he does not shine, he is darkness. The Gospel of Truth, speaking of Jesus, says, He is the shepherd who left behind the 99 sheep, which were not lost. He went searching for the one which was lost. Even on the Sabbath, he labored for the sheep, which he found fallen into the pit. He gave life to the sheep. He transferred the light of his sacred heart and threefold flame, having brought it up from the pit in order that you might know interiorly you the sons of interior knowledge, you, the keepers of the flame, the inheritors of this tradition. What is the Sabbath, the seventh day, on which it is not fitting for salvation to be idle? The Sabbath, or the seventh day, is upon us as the Aquarian age. We are in the seventh dispensation, and this is the Sabbath when it is not fitting for the path or the knowledge of salvation or its teachers to be idle, in order that you may speak from the day from above. You speak from the day from above. You speak out of your I am presence when you speak, which has no night, and from the light which does not sink because it is perfect. Say then from the heart that you are the perfect day, and in you dwells the light that does not fail. This then is Jesus' message to you. Say it. I am the perfect day. In me dwells the light that does not fail. I am the perfect day. And in me dwells the light that does not fail. I am the perfect day. And in me dwells the light that does not fail. Thank you, beloved. That is the conclusion of my message. The preceding lecture was given by Elizabeth Clare Prophet, world-renowned author and spiritual teacher. This is a presentation of the Summit Lighthouse, an international spiritual organization dedicated to universal enlightenment. 
Founded in 1958, the Summit Lighthouse is a beacon of truth to thousands worldwide and a leader in New Thought spirituality. This program is brought to you by the Summit Lighthouse. For more information, call 1-800-245-5445 or visit our website at www.summitlighthouse.org. Outside the USA, call 406-848-9500 or write to the Summit Lighthouse, 63 Summit Way, Gardner, Montana, 59030, USA.